your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. While you're Lucifer to light your smoke, smile, boys, that's the style. What's the use of worrying? It's never worth the while. So pack up your troubles in your old kit bag. your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. While you're a Lucifer to light your smoke, smile, boys, that's the style. What's the use of worrying? It's never worth the while. So pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile. Okay, thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me? Great. Uh, uh, good evening, I'm Frank O'Leary. I'm the chair of this event. I wanna thank Opera Nova and the very town of the Jack Hunt for getting us off to such a great start. You'd never know, we'd never worked together before, would you? Well, in any event, please rise for the posting of the colors. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A century ago, a young Jewish immigrant from Russia wrote a song that has inspired Americans ever since. Please join us in singing Irving Berlin's God bless America. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. The mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home. When Americans went to war a century ago, they were motivated by a rousing fight song written by the very town of the George M. Cohen. Please join us in singing Over There. Johnny, get, get your, your gun, gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me, every song of liberty. Hurry right away, no delay, go today. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to mind. To be proud, her boy's in line. Over there. Over there, send the word, send the word over there. 
that the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums are drumming everywhere. So prepare, say a prayer, send the word, send the word, but beware, we'll be, we'll be over, we're coming over, and we won't be back till it's over, over there. Let's hear it for the color guard. And that color guard was composed of Jennifer Slade from the Arlington County Fire Department, Kip Malcolm from the Police Department, Carl Van uh, Newkirk, former president of A. Arlington Historical Society, and John Lyon, and they have just departed to teach the Hun a lesson. So there. So, on behalf of the Arlington Historical Society and the World War I Task Force, I welcome you to Arlington Remembers the Great War. Tonight, we honor the approximately 200 Arlingtonians who served in World War I and the 13 who never returned. Who here served in the Second World War? Is there anybody? Anybody? Sir, would you, can you stand, sir? Could you please? <clears throat> <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Kling, I believe that you served in both the Pacific and Korea, didn't you? Two different wars. Thank you for your service, sir. Thank you. Do we have anyone from the Korean War era? Don't have to have been in Korea. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Do we have anyone from the Vietnam era? <laughs> Okay, we're getting more numerous. Thank us for our service. Okay, anyone from the Gulf War? Either one. Iraq and Afghanistan. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you for your service. You're really the reason we're here tonight. World War I guys can't appreciate tonight. I hope you do. <laughs> How about no war? <laughs> okay. Now, let me also note that we have this lovely facility tonight free of charge. So I want to thank the Navy League of the United States. Uh, this is their national headquarters. I know nothing about the Navy League of the United States except that Jim and I raised $438,000 for him back when in order to get the commissioning done of the USS Arlington I like to say that was how we float the boat. In any event, uh, Jim is going to be our first speaker. He's come all the way from North Carolina. He's not only going to tell us about the Navy League, but he's also going to tell us about the USS Arlington, what it's doing today, and its connection to World War I. Jim? Or Commander Pebbly, <laughs> Commander Pebbly, I should say. Good evening. As Frank said, my name is uh, Jim Pebley. I'm a retired Navy commander who was a 29-year resident of Arlington until last September. I think I graduated. I still help lead the USS Arlington Community Alliance. Frank won't let me leave the ship. That's the local group dedicated to keeping strong bonds between our community and the great gray ship the Navy named Arlington in the aftermath of the 9-11 attack on the Pentagon. Tonight I bring you greetings from Captain Todd Marzano and the ship's crew on this gathering. It's being held to honor and remember those who served, those who suffered, and those 13 Arlingtonians who made the ultimate sacrifice in World War I. And as an old sailor and longtime member of the Navy League, I would like to add my welcome to you to the Navy League headquarters here and for all the things they do to support the Navy in the background that so many people don't know. It's worth an exploration. Take a look at everything they've got outside. I was asked to speak tonight because last November, the Navy sailed our namesake ship to Norfolk, from Norfolk to the World War II Museum, yes, World War II in New Orleans, to participate in the beginning ceremonies for the 100th year anniversary of the armistice ending the war to end all wars. That was sadly a title that proved tragically mislabeled 20 years later, 
by an even wider, more destructive war. Should you ask how our modern namesake amphibia ship is related to a war fought 100 years ago, which is a problem Frank gave me when he asked me to speak tonight, I would tell you that as a career serviceman, that a commemoration for those who fought and those who died in any conflict gratifies the souls of all who have served and who now serve. By definition, we commemorate our World War I dead. When we do so, we honor their sacrifices by remembering their actions and their valor. The greatest gift we can offer in payment for their selfless acts is to honor their actions, to remember in our hearts and never forget what they gave us without expectation of repayment whatsoever. When America joined World War I, it changed the very relationship we had with the world. When the war was declared, we found our Army and Naval forces wholly under, unprepared, underfunded, and understaffed, and understrength in every regard. In that war's aftermath and during the run-up for World War II, America began growing to meet its potential as a global power for peace, as a defender for democracy, and as a shield for FDR's four freedoms for humans. As we strengthen our forces for freedom's defense, Arlington became the epicenter of our military, even more than just the host of a hollowed cemetery for earlier war heroes and a tomb for heroes unknown. But affirmed by the building of the Pentagon, Arlington's place in the military scheme. It's a Navy tradition to honor statesmen as well as states and recognize counties as well as cities who also serve. In World War II, you can see, good, that slides up, that the county's first, very first recognition was amplified by the naming of a converted tramp steamer after us. Um, okay, it wasn't pretty, but it was certainly a beginning. During Vietnam, the Navy converted a World War II carrier into a communications relay vessel, and the ship's role in command of communications reflected Arlington's increasing stature. And in 2013, the Navy commissioned a major ship of the line to honor the victims of the 9-11 attack and to recognize the valor of those county first responders who rushed to the aid of the stricken Pentagon. Our namesake, namesake ship, say that three times fast, strikes everyone who approaches her as a behemoth. She's seven stories tall. She's nearly 700 feet long. She can circle the globe on a single tank of fuel and carry 699 Marines to, to a hotspot anywhere in the world with our name on her. She can spew hovercraft, amphibious armored vehicles, helicopters, and Osprey aircraft across coastlines, reach inland tens of miles, and do so from over the ocean's horizon unseen. And wherever she sails, she carries behind her bridge a tribute room, honoring those who died on 9-11, those who responded, and those who now serve, a tribute room which was funded almost wholly by our community. Last month, the Arlington was the centerpiece of Fleet Week in New York City. Captain Marzano wrote to tell me that over 20,000 New Yorkers visited the ship, including the mayor, and he explained to everyone who visited the tribute room about how, Arl how the Arlington community had honored the memories of those victims and our heroes. As I close my remarks here tonight, I need to point out the features in our, our, vehicle, our uh, vessel's crest. Can you hit the next slide, please? Or not? Okay. The icon of that crest is surrounded by a golden rope. Um, keep trying it. With 184 twists around it, one for each victim. The crest of the Department of Defense is there, as well as the benches from the 9-11 memorial. With the Pentagon on one side, red with the blood of the victims. The crest incorporates Arlington House, representing our ship's fortitude. It is adorned with a Navy trident, signifying the strength of our nation. And there is a laurel, honoring the heroism 
of our first responders. I think that's a pretty good crest. So when we gather this evening to commemorate those who serve and those 13 who died in World War I, we rededicate ourselves to preserving the memory of all those who gave that last full measure of devotion by preserving a monument in Clarendon to our citizens lost, but by also hosting a cemetery bearing our name as a last resting place for heroes who have served in every conflict since and more so by celebrating those who serve today or will serve in the future on a powerful warship that bears the name Arlington. Wouldn't you agree that those are good and proper symbols for our increased devotion? Thank you very much, and God bless Arlington. The Navy has an expression when something is Extraordinarily well done. Bravo Zulu, Commander Pebbly. Okay, World War I is often called the Forgotten War. I guess Korea is too to a certain extent. But maybe that's not true for the young students in Arlington County. I know at least four students who know an awful lot about World War I, and they don't consider it to be a forgotten war. And those four are going to receive their awards tonight from the Arlington Historical Society and in order to do that, I require Max Gross and Robert White from the Historical Society. <laughs> Gentlemen. Yes, I am Max Gross, the, uh, currently the editor of the Arlington Historical Magazine and also the coordinator of uh, the Arlington County uh, High School Essay Contest, and I should say this year also eighth graders. Uh, this is a joint venture between the Society and Columbia Lodge, Masonic Lodge uh, 285. Frank and his comments uh, <coughs> noted that uh, World War I is sometimes called the Forgotten War by some historians. Uh, and that is the theme of the uh, essay topic. I want to read what the question was that the students were asked to write about. 2018 marks the 100th anniversary of the armistice ending World War I. World War I has been called a forgotten war by some historians. Have we forgotten this war in Arlington? Why or why not? We, we have a tie for third or honorable mention between Grace Freitas from Thomas More Middle School <laughs> and Charlotte Gimlin from Washington Lee. We have three things for you. First of all, I have a medallion commemorating the, the, uh, the centennial year that we're observing here. I have certificates uh, for you that you can put in a frame and hang on the wall. And we have a couple of checks for you. Yeah, let, let me just check to make sure the check is in there, though, before, <laughs> I, before I hand it to you. And Grace, yes, thank you. there's one for you, and thank you for your efforts you in, in um, working the essay. They were both very good. Thank you. The, the prize, by the way, was $250. Our second place winner was Harry Stevens from Yorktown High School. And I have for you a commemorative uh, disc and certificate. And uh, Robert is giving a check for $500. And our fourth, first place winner, uh, who's already been announced, as I said, is Anuj uh, Kemka from uh, Thomas Jefferson Middle School, this, uh, eighth grader. He's going to Thomas Jefferson High School in Fairfax County. He's coming in, right? All right, I have for you a commemorative uh, uh, medallion and also a certificate. 
and you've already received your check, it doesn't come twice. <laughs> anyway, Anuj has, uh, has an excellent essay which you'll be able to read in this year's issue of the Arlington Historical Society magazine, but uh, Anuj has uh, written a synopsis of his article which he's going to present to you tonight. Hi, my name is Anish Kemka, and my essay was titled World War I, An Afterthought in Arlington. It is important to recognize that during World War I, Arlington County had an extremely uh, different identity from the one that it has today. In fact, present-day Arlington held the name of Al Alexandria County and was an outlet of neighboring Alexandria City. By today's standards, Arlington County would have been considered a small rural county. Nonetheless, Arlington County played an active part in the United States' efforts in the First World War. Today, the Joint Base Meyer-Henderson Hall serves as one of the first recognized, uh, most recognizable reminders of the impact of World War I in Arlington. Furthermore, the federal government's influence in Arlington, Virginia today stems from the influx of employees from Arlington County into D.C. during the First World War. Ultimately, however, there is no doubt that the impact of World War I is far surpassed by that of the Second World War. The increasing population in Arlington County due to World War I slowly propelled it onto the path to urbanization. And by 1941, the year of the United States entry into World War II, Arlington County had made significant strides from its highly rural state of just 25 years earlier. However, while World War I may have laid the foundation for Arlington's growth, World War II fully instigated its complete transformation from a rural to urban area. In addition, the occurrence of World War II and further wars would coincide with the time when Arlington County bore many similarities to the Arlington of today. For these reasons, in the face of future wars that affected affected Arlington, and in a county with a far different identity than a hundred years earlier, World War I has struggled to enter and remain in the minds of many Arlingtonians. While the efforts of organizations throughout the county ensure that the war's legacy in Arlington will forever last, I believe that the First World War will continue to remain an afterthought in the county compared to later o events. Uh, writing the essay was a wonderful yet taxing experience, and I would like to thank my parents and my brother for supporting me throughout the process. Uh, as well, thank you to Ms. Finkelstein of the World War I Commemoration Task Force for providing me with the guidance I needed to start, and Ms. Payne, my social studies teacher, for reviewing my essay and giving me valuable advice. And thank you to the librarians at the Center for Local History for helping me look for resources and accommodating uh, being accommodating of me each time I came. And finally, I would like to thank the Arlington Historical so Society and Columbia Masonic Lodge for putting on this essay contest each year. Okay, let's move on. Uh, this is a very special part of the program because we in Arlington are really privileged to have a local scholar who is not only an authority on World War I, he is the authority when it comes to Arlington's participation in World War I, which he will probably deny as soon as he gets up here, but I know the truth. And Mark, there's no way you can change it. Let me introduce, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Mark Benbow of Marymount University. Mark. Set this back up. Um, thank you. My students will not believe I'm talking to a group without a PowerPoint, so I'll just have to point them to when this is broadcast on Arlington TV. Uh, but first off, on the essays, I was one of the judges, and they were excellent. Um, I did have a little bit of egg on my face because when it was suggested we allow middle schoolers, I was vehemently against it, saying, no, there's no way they can compete with high schoolers, da, da, da. Guess who wins? <laughs> Uh, and all four of the winners, I'd like to say, I wish my 
20 and 21 year old students at Marymount wrote as well as the four of you. And if you decide to become history majors, please come to Marymount. <laughs> I've st yeah. uh, stay in Arlington, come to Marymount. It's, not cl it's just up the street from Yorktown, you can walk. <laughs> Uh, seriously, it would be a pleasure to read essays as well written and as creative as these uh, when I'm grading term papers, which as much as I love teaching is definitely my least favorite part of the job. Uh, but they were all, they did excellent. Um, and I, I really enjoy having students like them in my classroom and I'm sure their teachers now enjoy having them as well. Uh, I was asked to talk about World War I in Arlington. Um, he said, oh, you're the expert on Arlington and World War I. Uh, well, I wrote some articles on it. it. There's not a lot written about it. Even C.B. Rose's excellent history, which is the best history of the county, spends like a paragraph on it. Uh, it's just an afterthought. Uh, and it has been called the Forgotten War. Um, Okay, so it's the Korean War. There's a number of forgotten wars. There are some that have actually been forgotten that my students are surprised. There was a U.S. Filipino War, yeah. <laughs> uh, War of 1812, at least you have Maryland license plates. There are a few others. Uh, Korea, yes, although they did have a long-running TV show that my students know, which lasted three times longer than the actual war. But World War I uh, has been lost in the shadow of the Second World War. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for this and a lot of good histories about it that I'm not going to go into all the details on now. It does make a certain amount of sense when you look at it. And when students come into my classes, I find that, like most Americans, I suspect what they know of the war dwindle wars, which, by the way, was the British Prime Minister Lloyd George's phrase, not Woodrow Wilson's. Uh, it does sound Wilsonian, so that's why they credited for him, but it's not. Uh, but uh, it has been largely forgotten except for snatches and bits from popular culture. I suspect if I ask my students as well as other generations as well, this isn't a complaint about millennials or something, uh, if I ask my fellow baby boomers or Gen X or any other generations coming along, I would get bits and pieces from popular culture, the Lusitania, uh, a doughboy, uh, trenches, uh, if I asked, you know, who, name five Americans who fought in the war, I would put good money. The fifth one will be Snoopy as the World War I flying ace, for lack of anybody else. Uh, I think the only reason people remember there was a first World War in the U.S. is because there had to be for there to be a second. Uh, but it is important not just because of the sacrifices made. It's not just a dry run for the much bigger and in the U.S., uh, much more remembered second, uh, but it was seen at the time as a struggle for liberty, a struggle for democracy. Woodrow Wilson did call this a war to protect democracy, to make the world safe for democracy. Uh, so tonight, talking about Arlington, I'm going to put in kind of the larger perspective of the war as a whole for the U.S. Of course, the U.S. enters the war in April of 1917. Uh, a lot of reasons for it. No bank loans were not one of them. Uh, I often get students that hear that. that. That was from the isolationist movement in the 1930s spread that. But there were lots of other reasons. Uh, German submarine warfare, German saboteurs in the U.S. Wilson really wanted a place at the peace table because he was convinced he could negotiate a peace to prevent another war. Uh, threats of Germany trying to get Mexico in the war with the U.S. The U.S. just sympathized more with the Allies. Uh, Arlington followed along. Arlington, like the rest of the U.S., gets dragged into the war rather reluctantly. It's in April 1917 felt that we don't really have much of a choice. We have to be in this. Uh, and so Arlington participates the same as the rest. Uh, if you live around this area, of course, we're in the shadow of D.C. Uh, and starting as we, March 1917, as it became clear we're going to be involved in the war, there's an anti-German frenzy of paranoia. Uh, that 
the Bureau of Investigation that wasn't the FBI for another 20 years, the Capitol Police, the DC Police, the Arlington Sheriff's Department, the Justice Department, uh, probably the post office, all got buried in literally in this area, thousands of tips of German spies and saboteurs, which ranged from the merely panicky to the absolutely ludicrous. My favorite example of the last was somebody uh, called the police in terrible fear because somebody was seen taking photos of the Great Falls. Uh, the tourist. <laughs> uh, Arlington went through this as well, and the Bureau of Investigation file showed that they dutifully tracked down possible German spies and saboteurs in what was in Alexandria County. Uh, there weren't a lot of Germans in the county. Uh, then, unlike now, Arlington had very few immigrants. Uh, this was, according to census, a 100% rural county which meant there were no settlements of more than 2,500 people. That counted as urban. They had a very generous definition of urban. Uh, there's like 120 Germans uh, in the county. Uh, second only to the Irish, there's like 150 Irish. Um, even in DC, there was an active but small German population, but the Bureau of Investigation investigated all of these reports of suspected traitors, spies, saboteurs, what have you. Uh, they went around to the postmasters in the county because they were to know everybody in the area where they delivered the mail. So the reports are filled. I went to the postmistress in Boston. I went to the postmaster in Clarendon and talked to them. Uh, and they didn't find any actual, any actual spies or saboteurs. Um, one poor gardener was heard, spoke German, was arrested and held. Uh, and finally, it turns out he was, in fact, Swiss. Uh, there were several of those. Well, his Swiss citizens also caught the broth. The Swiss legation in Washington was kept very busy during the, the war defending these. Yes, they're Swiss. Uh, there are also a lot of restrictions in this area. Uh, when the U.S. went to war first against Germany, we didn't go to war against Austria-Hungary until December 17, and we never declared war on Bulgaria or the Ottomans, the other two of the central powers. Uh, but first, Wilson issued several proclamations, and if you were German male 14 or older, at first you weren't allowed a wireless set, you weren't allowed a weapon. Uh, they did make some exemptions because there were some elderly, still German citizens that were Union Civil War vets living in the old soldier's home in DC. They were allowed to stay, but they even kicked out a German nun who had been in cloister for several decades. Uh, you weren't allowed to go up in an airship, and finally, you weren't allowed in D.C., period. Uh, which, given the boundaries here, meant that if someone was a German citizen walked onto the 14th Street Bridge, they were violating the law. And there were guards on the bridge, and one of the Bureau Investigation reports actually investigated somebody who spoke German crossing the bridge. Yes, he was Swiss. <laughs> uh, but you had this panic in the area. Now, of course, most Arlingtonians, what they remember for their young men was the draft. And there were numerous drafts. At first, it was men from 21 to 30. And then that was extended out to 18 to 45. Uh, and you just went in. They had one big registration day in June. And you went in, and you filled out the forms and turned it in. You could request an exemption. And hundreds of men requested exemptions, but that was expected. Uh, and they generally, most of them got it. You know, it was generally, you're the sole support of your family. Uh, you had already served in the military. Um, you weren't a US citizen. Uh, there are lots of different reasons for it. Uh, but they had a big holiday, businesses in the county and in D.C., and Alexandria closed. Uh, they had parades, church services, Boy Scouts took men in, they registered. Uh, in the end, some 600 men got a draft notice, um, of which about 80 did not show up. And that does not mean they're draft dodgers. Some had already volunteered. Uh, record keeping was not that good. Uh, so, or they said, I'm not a U.S. citizen. Uh, and I hadn't taken out my papers to become one yet. Uh, or they had some other legal exemption to it. Uh, but everybody got a number. When you showed up, 
you got a number. If you're the first man at that dex to fill out the form, you got a number one. If you're the second, you got a number two, and so on. Uh, and then they filled a giant glass bowl with capsules with numbers in them from one to 10,500, the largest jurisdiction in the US, probably New York City, registered over 10,000 men. And then they took 17 hours to draw up the numbers one by one. The first number they drew was 284. So if you were the 284th person in your district to show up and sign your name on the form, congratulations, guess where you're going next week? Uh, and then they did that through the whole thing. And so that's how men in Arlington were drafted the same as everywhere else. Uh, we don't know exactly how many men ant got that number. The records are very incomplete, but roughly 200 and some. Uh, so they set up camps in the area. Of course, you had Fort Myer. French officers showed up to build trenches there. Uh, to teach our army how to fight in a European-style trench. We hadn't had a large amount of trench warfare since the Siege of Petersburg at the end of the Civil War, and our military was used to fighting along the border with Mexico, in the Philippines, the Spanish-American War, the Plains Indian Wars with some of the olders. Uh, we really had no idea how to fight in a trench, and the French would teach us how to survive in a trench. Fort Myer had that. Uh, the former racetrack just to the south was turned into a large camp as well. And people throughout the county invited soldiers in you know, for a home-cooked meal, you know, enjoy some conversation, some singing, meet the family. Uh, and this is a segregated army. This is Jim Crow era. So there were all black units and all white units. And the local African-American community in, in Knox, Halls Hill, Queen City uh, invited in the African-American soldiers that came in. Uh, there, that provided parades, it provided speeches, uh, provided business for local business, particularly in Alexandria. Uh, it became a form of entertainment in the county to go listen to speakers, to watch the military bands, to watch the cavalry practice, to watch the soldiers practice. William Jennings Bryan came and gave a speech at the former racetrack, probably excited knowing Bryan that was a former racetrack that would fit his personality. Uh, it didn't always go that smoothly, though. Uh, in 1918, the county was caught up when there was a murder uh, by two soldiers from Fort Meade, got a taxi in DC, he drove them over the bridge into Arlington and then announced that they wanted the driver to drive him to Richmond. Uh, they were deserting, he refused. They killed him and dumped his body out near where the Rose Garden is, now out on Wilson Avenue. They were caught in Richmond uh, and eventually tried. Uh, Mr. Ball, who was the state's attorney at the time, was the one who, who prosecuted them. Uh, so the county was caught up in the excitement of a murder trial. Uh, when African-American soldiers were assigned to guard the bridges, uh, there were a lot of complaints. The county had a meeting and requested only white soldiers be used as guards, uh, and they were in fact replaced. Uh, and there was almost a race riot in Alexandria uh, when a couple of white soldiers stopped a black man in the street, started harassing him, he fought back, his friends came to help, their friends came to help, and he had to call in, the army basically pulled everybody back to base and told them to shut up and calm down. Um, so it wasn't always pleasant and listening to bands. There were tensions there as well. Uh, you also had the bond sales. Much of the war was paid for by savings bonds, you know, liberty loans and a victory loan after the end of the war, and by the new income tax uh, that had just passed in 1913. Uh, there were numerous bond campaigns. The first one kind of fizzled. Uh, it paid you about three and a quarter percent, which eh, was, iffy even then. They raised up a little above four, that made it competitive with other investments, and they put a huge advertising campaign. There was a mass parade down King Street in Alexandria, and Arlington participated. Uh, local Arlington Red Cross. Uh, at the time, Del Rey was part of Arlington. There was an Arlington school there, Mount Vernon. The kids there all put their money together and bought a bond. 
Uh, and county officials went to every single door in the county, supposedly, that was the plan, to knock on every single door in the county to get people to buy a bond. I'd like to suggest that uh, to the uh, board members here now as possible fundraising. <laughs> Just go to every door in the county and knock and ask them to make an investment. I'm sure it'll be just as easy as it was in 1917 and 1918. Uh, and Arlington, in the end, bought three times its quota of bonds. Richmond gave every community a quota, and Arlington was determined to outdo Alexandria. Yeah, that, that competition has always been there. So, oh, outdo Alexandria. Difficult is there's only one bank in the county, but you could go to banks in Alexandria, D.C. and buy them and say, credit this towards Alexandria County, and they did. So Alexandria was, Alexandria County was presented with a big flag with three stripes for the third loan, with three stars to indicate that we had tripled our quota. As the museum director on the historical society, I really wonder where that flag went. Uh, is it in a vault somewhere? Uh, is it in somebody's basement? Did it get tossed out in 1952 when nobody remembered what it was? I don't know, but we, the county was presented with this enormous flag. The next sale didn't go as well uh, because of the Spanish flu. Uh, as one of the slides you may have seen on Did You Know, it's only caught called that because Spain didn't censor newspapers. They were neutral, so they could write articles about how deadly this flu was. And it is an incredibly deadly flu. You know, my students are sometimes like, the flu. I'm going, you get a shot at giant. You know, when you go shopping, you get 10% off your groceries. You don't have to worry about it. Well, not in 1918. And this particular variety of the flu was enormously deadly. There are well-documented accounts of people feeling fine in the morning and being dead by nightfall. And it particularly hit young adults the most, who normally have the strongest immune system. Uh, but it killed, four, it killed multiple times, maybe five times as many people as the war did. Half of the American war dead died of the flu, including roughly half of the 13 known Arlingtonians who died from it. Ironically, it probably started in a U.S. military train camp in Kansas, jumping from pigs to soldiers, which the flu does. It dumps from pigs to birds to, to people and back and forth. This one apparently started in the pigs there to feed an army camp. There are other theories where it came. That's the one is the story, and it seemed to make the most sense to me reading the evidence. And then got spread with the U.S. military to Europe, where it spread around the world. Um, Ironically, given that the Germans did try an early form of biological warfare in the U.S., you may have seen the slide, they were infecting horses and mules with glanders and anthrax they were shipping to the Allies. Uh, the flu hit the German army worse than the Allied and American armies uh, because they were short on food and were weaker. Um, I, that is one of the lesser known contributions of the U.S. to victory in the war was accidentally bringing the flu that just devastated entire German divisions for months. Uh, but it went through the county as well. D.C. closed its schools, theaters, churches, so did the county. All the county schools closed. Remember that next time the flu comes next year? <laughs> closed it for days on end. Public gatherings were banned. One day in October 1918, they reported 50 new cases, which was a record. And in 1918, 54 Arlingtonians died from it, which doesn't sound like a lot until you realize the previous year's total was four. And the next year's total was 11 uh, from the second wave of the flu. It's very deadly flu, but it's also spread and is part of that war effort. Now, when the war is over, we know of 13 men that died. We don't know all the details. A number died of the flu. Some never got out of the continental US. Um, one died mysteriously, we don't know why, in France. Um, some died in training accidents, uh, particularly learning to be a pilot. Uh, that the training had almost as high a casualty rate as actually running into a German. Uh, if you were a pilot, that's true for every side in the war, not just for the U.S. Learning was the most hazardous thing you could do. Um, and, of course, there are others who died in combat. Uh, Mr. Lyon, for example, uh, 
died and was awarded, um, I don't remember, the Distinguished Service Cross, I remember correctly, went under fire in October 1918, near the end of the war. Uh, one of his fellow officers had fallen wounded. He went out to get him and was killed by German machine gun fire. Tragically, his family didn't learn about till after the war was over. So they celebrated the end of the war. If you can imagine a family living down near what's now Lyons Park, it was Lyon family, celebrating their son would be coming home and then a couple weeks later getting that dreaded telegram. That in fact, he had died some weeks before. Um, their emotions probably tempered somewhat by the letter they got from the man he had tried to save. And the man did survive, um, saying you know, how brave he was. He died trying to save me. Um, so there was at least some consolation in that. Uh, the war ends famously 11 AM on the 11th day of November, 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month. Armistice fighting suddenly stops like that. Uh, the last American casualty dies at 10.59 a.m. The last casualty of the entire war was a Canadian soldier is killed with three seconds left. Um, the fighting continued literally until the last second. The Western Front falls silent. That does not mean Europe became peaceful. I go that with my class. Oh, the bloodletting had only begun in Europe, but the official war was over for the actual national armies. Uh, the rest of the bloodletting was still to come, but the Western Front, the Italian Front, the Macedonian Front, uh, the Front in the Middle East, all fall silent. And at that point, we kind of started trying to forget the war. Uh, every state and territory tried to write an official history, only like seven finished it. Virginia never did. Uh, most of them didn't. And one reason why we're not sure we say, well, 13 known. Well, how can you not know how many men from your community died? Uh, they had to do with questionnaires. They went around, do you know somebody that died during the war? Did one of your comrades, member of your family, your brother, your son, your father, your next door neighbor never came home? Tell us about it. So we know of 13 names because their families came forward in 1930, 31 and said, yeah, XX, you know, such and such. Yeah, he was killed in the war. In some cases, we don't know any other details. Uh, in some cases, we know a great deal. Uh, and some, we're not even sure of the spelling of the name. Uh, but the war gets quickly buried. The veterans didn't want to think about it. Uh, the continuing unrest in Europe, the failure of the Versailles Treaty, uh, American public opinion quickly turned to this was a mistake popular culture largely forgot it. There's some movies we remember now looking back, uh, but there's nothing really to hang a hook on. There was no one interpretation. World War II is the good war. You know, Studs Terkel had a famous book about it called The Good War. And we can think of specific places. If I say Midway, you know anything about American history, you think June 1942 in the Pacific. If I say D-Day, you know where that is. You know, I can say Stalingrad. You got it. There are no, no, very few, if any, similar things from World War I. You have the Meuse Argonne, which most Americans never heard of, even though it's U.S. Army and Marines, one of their bloodiest battles in their entire history. They don't remember it. Other than that, if you look at the popular culture, it's all somewhere in France. And it's hard to tie a memory. And we couldn't agree. Was this a good war or a bad war? Just war, unjust war? Mistake? What was it? And the vets themselves, many of them decided they just didn't want to remember it. They get the questionnaire in the mail, tell us about your service, where'd you go, and all that, and they tear it up and they throw it away. And then World War II comes and overshadows in the US everything else. It's not true in Britain and Canada. World War I is, in some extent, more important to them than the World War II. But in the US, it gets shoved aside. But not only for this county and for this area and for the country as a whole, there's more to it than just, you know, we, we become a world power, which is certainly true and one of the most important aspects of it. But there also comes a sense of 
why did we do this? And it starts a questioning that never ended when the U.S. gets into a war of why are we doing this? It started an argument that continues on. Even before we get into World War II, there's an argument, America first versus aiding Britain. How do we do it? Uh, there's more to it than the practice uh, for the next war. That's important. There's more to it. There is the sacrifice, the soldiers, draftees, May have gone reluctantly, may have said, I'm doing my duty and going. There were lots of volunteers that said, I'm going to do this, that signed up for them. Of course, it's a life-changing experience. Uh, that it has become lost in the blaze of World War II. Uh, sort of like a smaller fire gets lost in the blaze of a much bigger one. But there is that sacrifice there. There are the lessons we learned as a free people from it. Uh, and we did ask the men of this area, and some of the women too, but particularly we asked the young men to go out and willingly risk losing their lives at just at the beginning as they are starting their lives for what the time seemed like such a good purpose. Uh, and they deserve to be remembered more than just glimpses in popular culture, more than just a fuzzy image of a doughboy in a trench. Uh, so I'm glad that we have this committee. I'm glad that we're having this event tonight, that we're building memorials, that World War I is finally going to get a memorial downtown, although it's not in the National Mall, at least it's actually a memorial. Uh, that we did ask men to make the sacrifice for us. And it's not fair to them to just brush it off and say, later we decided maybe we shouldn't have done this. Uh, that's a little late for them to decide that. We did ask them to do this. And they deserve to be remembered for answering that request. So thank you very much. I told you he knew his stuff. But, you know, the one thing he didn't tell you was why did we change our name from Alexandria County to Arlington County? Well, it seems that in 1919, on the anniversary of the armistice, the very first year, on November 11th, 1919, the citizens of this county asked the Army Air Corps to fly over the courthouse and the Army Air Corps agreed to fly over the Alexandria County Courthouse. And at the appointed hour, the good citizens of Arlington were standing out at the intersection of Wilson Courthouse awaiting the Army Air Corps. And they looked up and, you know, they had binoculars and they kept looking and looking and looking. And after about 20 minutes, they concluded they weren't coming. What they didn't know was down in Alexandria City, the people were diving for cover, believing that they were being attacked by the Germans. <clears throat> now, that's a wonderful story, but it's totally apocryphal. Charlie Clark, is he still here? Is he gone? Okay, Charlie Clark loves that story. I told it to him, and I keep saying, Charlie, when you tell it, please use the word apocryphal. <laughs> but I'm going to keep telling it. I love it. Well, let me also say that Arlington County, in addition to changing its name and becoming Arlington instead of Alexandria County, made a great decision when they appointed Dr. Allison Finkelstein to chair the World War I task force. They could not have found a more appropriate or capable person. And here, here, here she is to share her thoughts on the Great War and what our task force, World War I task force, hopes to accomplish. I give you Dr. Allison Finkelstein. Thank you, Frank, for that very kind introduction, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Arlington World War I Commemoration Task Force, I would like to thank you all for attending our fundraiser tonight. We truly appreciate your generosity and your support of our mission. A lot of hard work went into putting this event together. So I'm the last speaker of the night, so it's a hard job. I've got to get you all re-energized and then send you out the door. So I'm going to tell you exactly what I am talking about. I've divided my brief remarks into three parts. 
First, I'm going to give you a brief background of who we are as the Arlington World War I Commemoration Task Force. And then second, I'm going to explain the project that we are raising money for tonight. And third, I'm going to discuss why this project is so important for our community. So to begin, the Arlington County Board created the Arlington World War I Commemoration Task Force to recognize the 100th anniversary of World War I in our community. Since our inception of March of 2017, we have focused on educating the county about the significance of the Great War, while also honoring the heroism and the sacrifice of those who served. And we've been doing this through public programs and commemorative events. Our mission can best be described by three objectives which have guided our programming. Community engagement, community service, and education. Over the past year, our dedicated members, all of whom are volunteers, by the way, have organized or participated in 25 events. These have included author talks with historians, a World War I film series at the Arlington County Library, and a booth at the Arlington County Fair. But most importantly, we have included community service and veterans advocacy as a key part of our work. Last fall, we organized a toiletry drive, and we donated over 30 pounds of toiletries to our local veterans hospitals. And just this May, we sponsored with the John Lyon VFW Post 3150, a lecture that focused on the history of PTSD and the World War I era, and it actually concluded with a panel of veterans who very honestly shared their own experiences with PTSD. In our final five months, we have a robust schedule of events, and I encourage you all to visit our website to learn what those are and join us at them. We are especially excited to return to the Arlington County Fair in August because we were selected to bring the Virginia World War I and World War II Commemoration Commission's Profiles of Honor mobile tour bus with us to the fair. This is basically an RV that has a museum exhibit inside of it about World War I and World War II in Virginia. And it even allows people to come and bring their photographs and documents, have them scanned and included in the museum. So that's really exciting. We hope you will come visit it. And we are, of course, gearing up for the most significant event of our commemorative calendar. In partnership with our local veterans organizations, we are organizing a major ceremony to mark the 100th anniversary of Armistice Day on November 11th. Held at the Clarendon War Memorial, this will be a very big and important local event. I hope to see all of you there so that we can fill the streets of Clarendon and properly honor those who served and sacrificed in World War I. Now that you know who we are as a task force, I will move on to my second topic, which is an explanation of the project we are raising all of this money for tonight. To fulfill the objectives outlined in our mission, the task force proposed and is now executing a project to develop and install a series of informational panels at the Clarendon War Memorial. These panels will interpret the entire history of the memorial and all of the wars it commemorates with a special focus on its origins as a World War I memorial. The panels will contextualize the memorial so our community can learn about the complex issues embedded in its history. It's important to note, however, that these panels will not actually go on to the Clarendon War Memorial, nor will they change anything on the memorial. Rather, they will be located in the park surrounding the memorial so that visitors can learn what this memorial represents. The panels will operate kind of like the outdoor wayside panels you might have seen at some national parks. They're going to explain this memorial as a multi-layered site of memory, a historic place that is significant both for the service members it commemorates, but also for its own role in our own community and its history. It is the goal of the task force to unveil some of these panels at our Armistice Day ceremony on November 11th. However, the county was not able to appropriate any funds for the all-volunteer task force, so the entire cost of this big project has to be met through fundraising. And I'm proud to share tonight that the task force took it upon ourselves to finance this on our own, and we were successfully awarded a 100 Cities, 100 Memorials matching grant from the National World War I Centennial Commission and the Pritzker Military Museum and Library.
It was a real team effort that we were able to put that application in, and we we're actually the only community in the Commonwealth of Virginia to receive one of these grants, so it really is a significant achievement. But to fully benefit from the matching component of this opportunity and finance the project, we have to raise the remaining funds. And that, of course, is why we are all here tonight, to raise the ten dollars to $15,000 we need to complete this project in a professional manner that will appropriately honor the Arlingtonians it memorializes. As a truly grassroots effort, just like people did in the 1920s after World War I, we are raising money to teach our residents about the history and legacy of the Clarendon War Memorial, but also about the larger story of Arlington's military heritage through a local and a national perspective. And this brings me to my third, and I promise, my final point of the evening, an explanation of why this project is so very important to our community. Most of you have probably walked by the Clarendon War Memorial many times. You may have noticed that this stone monument takes up a very prominent space in the center of Clarendon. Large and formal, it sits atop a grassy platform above the sidewalk with an eagle perched at its very top. You would think that it would be a very hard thing to miss. But in the midst of the bustling bars and the restaurants on the surrounding streets, people overlook this memorial every day. Too many people unintentionally are oblivious to this memorial, and its meaning actually remains hidden on the landscape, even though it's in clear view. Our project aims to address this by providing the public with easily accessible information about the memorial and its history. The panels will indicate that there is something in the vicinity that people should stop and look at and learn about. By placing these markers near the memorial, we are creating an educational space within this memorial landscape, free and available to everyone who wants to see them. These panels will teach our community about the history of the county, the commonwealth, the nation, and perhaps even about ourselves. As a historian, I see this educational mission as one of the most important aspects of the project. The panels will concisely discuss the history of each war commemorated on it, so that our current veterans will be able to see their own service recognized among the veterans of the past. Additionally, the panels will highlight the lives of some of the individuals who are commemorated on the memorial, and this will personalize it. At the same time, this memorial is going to make sure that the sacrifices of these men are not forgotten in our community. One panel is actually going to focus solely on the history of the memorial itself and its origins as a World War I monument. And by outlining the whole trajectory of its history and its development, these panels will situate the memorial within the larger historical context. And they're actually going to help us learn about the larger development of Arlington County at the same time. By focusing on historical context and personal stories, this installation will humanize the past and remind our community that this memorial is really a physical representation of the men and women who support our military. This includes all veterans who served in peace and in war. It includes those with emotional scars as well as physical wounds. It includes the women who volunteered at home or abroad or served in uniform. And it includes the civilians and the families who supported the armed forces and our veterans long after the guns had been silenced. I would like to finish my remarks by reading the last stanza of a poem written in 1926 by Maedna Corbett, a woman who served overseas with the American Red Cross during World War I. Now, although she was not from Arlington, I think her poem's message can inspire us as we carry on with our project and we raise the money to fund it. The poem, titled Rededication, discusses the war's horrors, and it suggests how the living should commemorate the dead. It concludes with the following lines. Then, while today we celebrate the victory to them denied, let us, our lives, rededicate to keep alive the faith which led these glorious legions of the dead. As Miss Corbett suggested 92 years ago, it is up to us, the living, to rededicate this memorial, 
to keep alive the memory of those who lost their lives in World War I and all subsequent conflicts. I urge you to keep her words in mind and join in our efforts to raise the funds we need for our panel's project. For our event tonight, and this project at the Clarendon War Memorial is really about the type of rededication that Ms. Corbett wrote about. We are here gathered tonight as a community to honor the people of Arlington who served our nation by teaching each other about their sacrifices and about their history. What we are doing this evening is about more than enjoying a lovely reception with wine in our hands and a smile on our faces. It is about more than receiving a beautiful challenge coin and seeing our names listed on brochures as a donor. It is actually about remembering the people who came before us and bringing a local grassroots focus to our World War I commemoration. It is about remembering all of the Americans who came together so many years ago to serve our nation. It is about the American story, inspiring, complex, and ever-changing and making sure that we do not forget the World War I generation. For they, and all those who came before and after them, shaped this nation that we all call home. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allison. You can see why she's in charge. OK, I'd like to close as follows. Just reading something very lovely. Day is done, gone the sun, from the lakes, from the hills, from the sky. All is well, safely rest, God is nigh. Those are the lyrics to a lovely and haunting melody which many of you know. We are very much honored tonight to have Jerry Villanueva with his 1917 bugle sound taps. You all right? probably guessed it, but Yari is the bugler for the old guard, which means that he's as good as it gets. He's the best there is. And Yari, again, thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight and participating. Thank all of you for coming. If it weren't for you, we wouldn't be here. So thank you for coming. Drive safely going home. It's a long way to tip Good day.